Alan Wake is a game that leaves a great many loose threads to tug at, even upon completion. For every mystery and plot point it resolves or explains by the end of six chapters and two DLCs, as well as a spin-off game, seemingly another two or three are created to leave fans hanging and wanting more. One of these mysteries surrounds two of the main characters of the game, the titular Alan Wake and his guide through the strange events unfolding, the diver Thomas Zane, and their relationship to one another. Throughout the game, we constantly see hints and clues that the two are far more intricately linked than simply two men who have undergone the same traumatic events, and as a result, many theories have been made over the years to try and connect the myriad, oftentimes seemingly contradictory dots into one satisfying picture. And in this video, I want to present my own thoughts and theories about how they are interconnected, trying to make sense of as many of the disparate threads and link them together in a way that doesn't go against the rules set out by Remedy about how the world they inhabit works. As such, I'll be splitting this video into three parts, analysing the different clues the Alan Wake franchise has shown, then laying out the rules of how both characters operate, before finally creating a timeline for my theory that tries to link together as many of these plot points together. This video will contain spoilers both major and minor to every game in the Remedy Connected universe, so Alan Wake, its DLCs, Alan Wake's American Nightmare and Control's AWE DLC, as well as the ARG, This House of Dreams. But without further ado, let's dive in. Most of the clues to Wake and Zane's relationship throughout Alan Wake can be split essentially into three different camps. Thomas Zane created Alan Wake as a character in his writings in the 70s, both writers created each other in some sort of Ouroboros loop, or Alan Wake is a reincarnation of Thomas Zane after he sank into Cauldron Lake. There are clues that both support and seemingly deny all of these theories, so I'm going to more or less just list everything off so that we have everything ready and on hand to build a final theory. Starting with the idea of reincarnation, mainly because this is the theory that has the least overlap with everything else, a lot of the arguments here are related to the similarities between the two characters. Obviously, both essentially have undergone the same series of events. A famous creative of some kind, a writer for Wake and a poet or filmmaker for Zane, visits Bright Falls with their partner for some R&R. This goes very poorly for both of them when they end up on Bird Lake Cabin on Cauldron Lake, Zane's partner Barbara Zagger drowned in the lake, whilst Wake's wife Alice was taken by the Dark Presence. At that point, both men figure out that their writing has reality warping effects when written in Bird Lake Cabin slash the Dark Place, and both resolve to bring back their lovers using it, only for it to go horribly wrong when the Dark Presence warps the story to fit its own agenda. At that point, they both come to the realisation that they must sacrifice themselves to finish their text and once again seal their foe in the lake, and so both of them enter the lake and are never seen again. But even outside of that, their similarities can be attributed to more than just events in their lives, which could be mere coincidence, as both men look practically the same, despite having no biological relation to one another. In the ending to Alan Wake, Zane and Barbara share the voices of Alan and Alice, whilst the Anderson brothers, upon meeting Wake for the first time, call him by the name Tom, having confused him with their old friend. But that first thing could be some sort of dark place trick, whilst the second could be merely the ramblings of two old rock stars who are suffering the effects of a life of drugs, alcohol and partying, right? Well, ignoring the obvious fact that the two have much more going on behind the scenes than initial impression suggests, their confusion is backed up when Wake and Zane appear in Control's AWE DLC, only for Zane to have dropped the diver suit to appear like a clone of Wake. There's a whole series of other arguments and theories to explain why this is, such as this being some sort of meta choice or that this isn't Thomas Zane at all, which I don't fully agree with and would like to make a video entirely on someday, but taking this at face value, it certainly seems like Wake and Zane are effectively the same person, reincarnated and seeking advice from their original, detached from reality self. I don't fully agree with this theory though. I don't think there's anything in any Remedy game that really backs up reincarnation being a possibility through any explored means, and it doesn't really sit right with Zane's story about going off to live with Jack in a small utopian domain deep in the dark place. Of course, discussions then move on to how trustworthy Zane is, but again, topic for another time. Next potential theory is that Wake and Zane somehow both created each other, and through their experiences in the dark place, have created an Ouroboros loop that ensured they keep creating each other, if that makes sense. Not a time loop per se, 
rather that a fixed point in both of their lives gives rise to the other, and time continues around that. This theory comes around as a sort of fused interpretation of both the other main theories, the similarities between Wake and Zane combined with the fact that Wake could have seemingly created almost every aspect of the game leads to the conclusion that he might have created Zane, but then the preserved writings of Zane, seemingly indicating he created Wake, muddies the waters. There are a few reasons I don't think this is the case though, which I'll get to shortly, but I think the theory mostly comes around to the vagueness of just what the limits of the reality manipulation artist can achieve in Cauldron Lake actually are. There's one final major theory, which I personally think comes the closest to explaining how Zane and Wake connect to one another, and it's the fact that Thomas Zane created Alan Wake, without the timey-wimey Ouroboros complication of the inverse being true as well. Clues to this mostly come down to the mysteries of Wake's early life, such as an absent father and the invention of the clicker, which Wake inexplicably finds in Zane's most protected shoebox of all. The manuscript page found in the same shoebox that housed the clicker, which further describes how Wake used it, brings further credence to this concept. It's also notable that the Bright Force AWE that Zane caused, that ultimately led to his detachment from conventional reality, occurred in 1976, whereas Alan Wake wouldn't be born until 1978. I do have to say that I don't believe that Zane truly created Wake though. The manuscript page he wrote never references Wake's birth or creation, only a moment in his life that occurred many years later. I take this, along with some of the rules we'll get to very shortly, there's more showing that Zane had some degree of influence in Wake's life, not truly forcing his hand at any moment, but recognising a person who would best fit into the story he needed, and in instilling ideas and opening life paths he might have never otherwise thought of. So, we've looked at the skeleton of Eid's theory, and now it's time to take the pre-established rules of the world remedy is created and see how each one holds up. The first, and by far most important rule, is that the reality manipulation artists in the dark place are capable of stops sort of being able to outright create new objects. Artists can only nudge and manipulate people and objects into working as part of their story, not create new people or force someone to act in a way that isn't in their character. Alan can't force a purely good, extremely moral person to go on a killing spree, as an extreme example. Overstepping this boundary seems to allow the Dark Presence a much greater level of power. Wake understands not to do this through Zane's messages, and whilst Zane did initially step over this line, by the time he wrote the manuscript relating to Wake, he has learned his lesson and wrote only what could reasonably happen. This initial rule does admittedly destroy these initial ideas for each theory. Zane couldn't create a reincarnation of himself, and neither writer nor poet could create the other, defeating both other theories. This does admittedly throw a wrench into every theory, and could initially make it seem like none of them really work, which is where I would like to say that all three I've discussed here are only the foundation of each line of thinking. Most people will take this foundation and then embellish and expand on it to try and make it fit into the world, which is ultimately what I'm doing here in this video. But the concept of a true Ouroboros loop, at least in my opinion, is entirely sattered by a second, admittedly unconfirmed rule. Artists cannot affect the past or past events. This is never truly confirmed like the limits of creation were in the Control Art book, but to my recollection, there's never a point in any Remedy game where Wake or Zane have been undeniably shown to have written past events into being. There are one or two points which could be argued do so this occurring, but I'm pretty sure my theory explains everything fairly conclusively. The other reason I say this is that it avoids unsatisfying narrative moments without creating plot holes. Either writer simply rewriting the events that led them into their horrific experiences to avoid them wouldn't be satisfying to an audience, but would be the most obvious and logical thing to do. Finally, you may have thought about how the timeline of Zane's death to Alan Wake's birth doesn't really add up if he had no part in his creation. How would someone who disappeared in 1976 even know about the existence of someone born in 1978, long before they would have even been conceived? Indeed, this might cause you to then think about how someone in Stuck in the Dark Place would even be able to know any about anything occurring in the outside world, as they can't exactly poke their head out of Cauldron Lake and have a walk around Bright Falls. This has been seemingly answered by a third law of the Dark Place, and the only one to actually benefit a trapped artist. Creating art there grants the artist some level of precognitive abilities. 
Alan seemed to have already had a slight tendency, even before his interactions with the paranatural. Having written TV episodes and entire book franchises about future events and people he couldn't possibly know, with a Night Springs episode mirroring events in Control storyline years before they occur, and the Alex Casey book series airing close to the life of an FBI agent of the same name. Admittedly, that last point is a bit iffy, as we really don't know anything about the Alex Casey appearing in Alan Wake 2, but I can see this being a plot point in the game. But even if he already had those abilities, other lines of dialogue and text suggest that the Dark Place can become essentially a swirling tornado of people, places and props for a trapped artist to use as the subjects of a new piece. Fragments of the histories revealed to be used as anchor points to set the story in reality. And with all these theories discussed and the laws laid out, I think it's finally time for me to set out my timeline of events that hopefully sets out the relationship of the writer and poet in a satisfactory manner. Bright Force, 1976. A European filmmaker and poet by the name of Thomas Zane has just had a truly harrowing, otherworldly experience. After his lover, Barbara Dagger, drowned in the lake surrounding his Baudelaire cabin, his assistant Emil Hartmann managed to convince him to use the reality saving powers of the lake to bring her back from the dead. Having ignored the literary rules required to produce a compelling story to instead bring back his lover with no struggle, Zane only manages to bring forth a cruel parody of the woman, a witch with a false face, the Dark Presence. Realising his mistake and recognising where he was at fault, he quickly writes a manuscript that fully includes themes of sacrifice and loss, banishing the entity back to the lake at the cost of his own existence. All traces of Thomas Zane are swept away unless they are stored in a Sioux box. As Cauldron Lake's Caldera erupts and sinks his beloved cabin, his spirit sinks to the bottom of the lake, where it reunites with the soul of the real Zaka, content in the utopian pocket dimension he's created for the two of them. But despite how the story has seemingly concluded, it has truly only just begun. This was merely the prologue, the few short pages that set the tone for what is to come, and in 1978, in New York, the real main character is born, Alan Wake. Using the precognition the waters of the lake granted him, Zane recognised that Wake has the potential to seal the Dark Presence away forever, and has written his manuscript to nudge Wake into being in the right place at the right time, with the right equipment. Enclosed in one of his shoeboxes is a disconnected light switch, and as the young Wake is scared of the dark, Zane has made sure his mother gives to him an object much the same, the clicker an item so strongly ingrained in the young boy's mind that when he sees a very similar item three decades later, he can imbue it with the power he once believed his version had, and use it to seal away the dark presence. Wake lives a successful life as a writer for several decades, subtly guided by Zane's manuscript to ensure he stays on the correct path. His free will is never hampered, as Zane knew he had the potential to reach the desired endpoint even without his help, but it guarantees he makes the correct decisions when they're needed. He writes stories about small American towns living through bizarre events and of government agencies attempting to rationalise the unexplainable, but his most successful series is of a New York PI living in a noir-like version of his home city. His life and creative works are thriving, until he finishes his most successful series of all and runs out of ideas. For two years, Wake can't put pen to paper, as Zane needs him to become desperate enough to accept a holiday retreat with his loving wife to the idyllic town of Bright Falls, Washington, where the final pages of his manuscript can come to a close. Zane sets the stage and assigns Wake an adversary, the Dark Presence, which was never truly defeated even with Zane's sacrifice, and Zane's story finally ends with him temporarily restoring Birdleg Heaven to reality before dredging his soul back up from the depths to save Alan from the clutches of the Dark Presence. From there, the story of the Alan Wake franchise truly begins, with Thomas Zane acting as a mentor and guide to an Alan that must create his own manuscript, navigate the Dark Place without losing his sanity, destroy the Dark Presence and its many minions once and for all, and finally, hopefully, return to reality once more. So, what do you think? 
I came up with this theory mainly by trying to rationalise how impossible events occurred outside of the influence of the departure manuscript, such as Birdlet Cabin reappearing for a day, or the clicker somehow teleporting to the dam in the well-lit room from presumably somewhere in New York. I realised that the game never actually states Thomas Zane's writings ended. People have just assumed that they did after he fell into the dark place for the last time, and his existence was erased. But it's also clear that stories written in Codron Lake are somewhat more ethereal than words on a page, and I can't recall anything that would mean it couldn't have continued in perpetuity until another writer came to finish his mission. That being said, I'd love to hear how other people interpreted Alan Wake and his relationship with the diver, and whether you came to a different conclusion. I admit that this theory came about mostly because I don't want to imagine the artist in the dark place being able to rewrite the past, which is the only way Wake could write about things like Birdlair Cabin or The Clicker, because I feel that would ruin a lot of the stakes and tension of any upcoming Remedy game. But, having said all of that, I do hope you enjoyed the video, I'm looking forward to maybe seeing more answers for theories like these in Alan Wake 2, and finally, thank you for watching.